but I'm very, very happy to speak. And before kind of starting the uh, presentation, I would like to do some small survey to see what's the audience. Uh, can you tell me how many of you are students? If you, if you can raise your hand. And how many of you are generally in IT and really want to kind of dive into machine learning? Okay, so I, I would assume the others are working in machine learning. Uh, others, uh, uh, other parties here. So, what I'm going to talk about today is more about what type of challenges we're facing. Uh, when we're doing a uh, practical machine learning and then uh, how to overcome uh, those challenges. The title is Tools to Share Data Sets and Find Imperfect Data in Supervision. So, before uh, jumping to the tools, I would like to give an overview of what I'm going to present today. So, it will be some background information about the company, uh, who we are, I think Frank mentioned briefly. Uh, uh, who I am, and then I would, I would like to introduce the company itself, and then talk about the tools uh, that you can use to share data sets with the rest of the world, and then uh, some of the other tools that will really help you to find the mistakes in your data, which is more or less bigger problem at the moment to solve machine learning problems rather than uh, building models. So. Uh, I see Rand is nodding. Uh, it's, 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 it's becoming a new paradigm, but uh, let's see how we uh, can discuss more about this. So, okay, uh, a little bit about the company and the background about the company. So, the company was created about three years ago by me and my brother, who were both PhD students. My brother was in Switzerland, I was in Sweden, and uh, I was doing research in a field where I had something that was really, really applicable in the uh, intervision field, uh, specifically in age annotation. And then we decided to create the company after attending a very large intervision conference. So at the moment, uh, we raised about $18 million in, in funding from some of the best uh, European and Silicon Valley investors. And uh, we're about 80 plus at the moment city enthusiasts that are uh, making our lives easier to try and then uh, grow geometry. Uh, super proud to mention uh, who we were able to bring to our side to uh, make them an advisor so we can know what to build next and how to thrive in this very challenging AI field. So uh, we have really world class advisors such as Professor. Trevor Bell, who was, uh, if you know, the old library cafe, he was the creator of cafe, he's the AI director of Berkeley Artificial Intelligence uh, Lab, and one of the most cited professors of all time. Uh, Professor Peter Gill is more like a rising rock star. As, as a professor, he was enjoying his student, where he did uh, the really famous inverse helicopter. Uh, reinforcement learning problem while he's, he was in PhD and at the moment as a professor he's also building a billion dollar company in robotics uh, which is called Tugger and And I assume uh, many of you know maybe Gary Bresky who is the creator of OpenCV so it's a library that most people use when they're uh, building with computer vision uh, so we're happy to have those people in our uh, library. Uh, and a little bit what we're building is we're building an application development platform for uh, computer vision products. And what does it really mean is that we're dividing it down into four different components. So the first component, when you want to build an AI or computer vision, you need really high quality uh, annotation tool to create those training data. So you can learn uh, from the pages. So we built this collaboration platform where several hundred people can work, can create millions of annotations. They can collaborate. They can make sure that the quality is in the right place uh, to uh, create those data sets. 
the second thing what we created, uh, we went and we talked over 300 different uh, annotation service companies, mainly in India, Philippines, Bangladesh, and uh, Southeast Asia, in some African countries, and we created a marketplace where we know how to uh, tell our customers which company to work because it's a very, very challenging problem to find a trusted service company that will have, let's say, 50 people that will work consistently and they will not really perform a terrible job on your annotation, which will result in terrible models. So basically, this managed marketplace is something that we're uh, on top of when we're talking with our customers, we're managing uh, the relationship between the customers and the service company. More importantly, uh, we built a no-code uh, computer vision uh, platform where we allow our users to build models, models directly in the platform and then use those models uh, to version them, to improve them, and at the end to deploy them into their production. So you don't really need uh, that much computer vision knowledge uh, to use our platform and build models and then improve your models. And then last but not least, which I'm going to uh, concentrate most during the talk, is this data curation system. And what data curation is, is once you're getting your initial first batch of annotations, it is becoming extremely difficult to find the mistakes, to find that imperfect data, and then have the right tooling to correct those mistakes. Uh, as you move into a large scale, million image, two million image, then it's becoming very, very essential to have uh, really good tools for that. Okay, so enough about the company. So uh, let me start the first part, uh, which might be interesting in generally for the audience, for the students, for uh, people that are dealing with data set and then they want to publish data set and share with the community. So as a company, what we did is uh, we created this platform where you can come and submit a data set and uh, your data set will be uh, visible uh, for the rest of the world. And then what they can do is they can visualize the data sets on top of the annotations and they, they will see the quality of the data set before downloading and using it uh, for their own production. But maybe you can say that if you're aware of a uh, Kaggle website, then you might say that Kaggle already has those uh, data sets that you can kind of upload your data set and somebody can come and download uh, the data set. So why we're doing something that uh, Kaggle did and uh, what is the meaning of uh, this, right? So, so uh, the reason what we're doing, we're adding two very main essential, essential components into these uh, data sets. So the first one is when you have a data set published, let's say all the published and 82 data set and it's 2.3 terabytes, you can simply know uh, there is very few computers that will handle that. You cannot really download that data set. And more importantly, not all the people need all the data set. They need very part of that data set, and before they download that part, they would like to visualize and see what is in the data set uh, that uh, is, uh, is it maybe useful for them or not useful for them. So we created this uh, similar to query system, uh, this site where you, when you upload your data set, first of all, you can see uh, the annotations on top of the images. And when you're trying to find something, let's say if you're trying to find uh, frames that have wallpaper in it, or if you want to find frames that have more than 10 downloaded boxes, you can simply write, uh, give me all the images that have a count not more than 10, and that contains a ball. So this will give you all the ball images that have more than uh, 10 boxes. Uh, and this way, you will have like a very easy way to kind of uh, dig down in your data set, find the things that you're interested in, rather than kind of going through these millions or tens of thousands of frames. And then once you find that, then you will be able to download it. And then you don't really need to use that 2.3 terabytes. 
maybe this one gigabyte data set will be enough for you to have initial set of experiments to uh, continue your research. Similarly, I assume many of you have worked with COPA data set. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a COPA data set on our end where you can go and find, let's say, if you're interested in a certain class, then you can search that class and then visualize those images and then download not really 20 gigabytes, but only a few hundred megabytes just to do a like, very quick experiment. So why uh, why this is useful, right? So the other thing what uh, you can do when you're uploading the data set, imagine you're a researcher and you want to publish your results and share it with uh, the rest of the community. Very often when you're reading research papers, then you see that they're cherry picking like five images and then everything is super nice, uh, uh, their predictions are amazing and uh, you don't really see the flavor of their predictions uh, just by reading the paper. So what we're allowing for uh, researchers to do is to upload the data set, the annotations and then the predictions together and then they can put like one simple link in their paper that you can click and then go and visualize their predictions together with the annotations, right? So here is an example, for example. Uh, for example, I have a very dummy example of football players. Uh, the ones that are in solid lines, they are my annotations, and then I put the predictions in the dashed line, so now I can see that my algorithm is able to classify this correctly, this one incorrectly, and then there are some missing annotations. So it will be a lot easier for the researchers to see how their algorithm is performing on specific subsets before moving on and doing more experiments. And in general, the entire scientific community can benefit from this because when you're reading the paper, as I was mentioning here, there is no way to understand whether uh, the performance is good or bad, how they're dealing with the edge cases, and so on. So now we're slowly coming to this part of imperfect data, and imperfect data exists pretty much everywhere. ImageNet, uh, Microsoft Topo dataset, all of those datasets have so much error in it that just correcting that error itself will become like a very good paper and can be published in one of the top uh, uh, computer vision or AI companies. But that's a very challenging problem to find the mistakes quickly and then correct them. So during this talk, what I will introduce is four types of uh, imperfect data that um, we can encounter while we're uh, doing research or creating annotations in our images. So the first one, which is very, very important, is uh, the bias in, in imperfect data. The bias can be in form of, uh, it can be very different types of bias. It can be time bias, it can be class bias, it can be the attribution bias of those classes, it can be uh, annotator bias, it can be the quality assurance person bias when they approve and disapprove certain images and so on. The second thing we will discuss is how to find those imperfect data easily with. Uh, the tools that I, I will present today. Uh, the third thing is uh, we'll talk about versioning the imperfect data. And the idea uh, is often that when I'm trying to correct my data set, very often I do those corrections. I don't really say the past data set. I start performing new experiments. I build new models. And then all of a sudden, I see that uh, the accuracy is dropping. Uh, as a result, I want to go back, and then there is no way. Now I'm stuck with my uh, worst data set, so it's very, very important to version that data set in order to be able to come back and forth, similar to GitHub if you're using uh, that extensively, right? And then the fourth one uh, is uh, how to find the corner cases very quickly, and then how to deal with the class imbalance. Uh, our world is naturally imbalanced in a sense that uh, when we take 
uh, random images, there is a higher chance that you will see uh, a human rather than a mouse, for example. So if you're trying to create a balanced data set, which is very much needed to create a high accuracy computer vision models, then uh, it's becoming a very challenging problem. So let's start with the bias, right? What do we mean uh, by bias? So here I give a very simple example of class correlation bias between two different uh, annotators or labels. So imagine that uh, the Rick, who is our first annotator, is annotating buses, cars, and uh, bikes. And then when Rick is annotating cars, then there is a 35% chance or correlation that uh, that person will also annotate uh, cars and bikes together. When you're looking to our second annotator, everything else is fine, but then a gen tends to not really include the buses and cars together, or bikes and cars together. And uh, what this means is that there is actually a certain type of bias between these two annotators, which is the class correlation bias. And in order to have tools to kind of easily identify those things, will really help you to kind of find uh, bad annotators or unbiased uh, annotators, and then give them either a feedback how to improve, or maybe you need to remove them uh, from the job because you see that uh, there is no way uh, to. Uh, uh, to clarify, I mean, do you need uh, bikes and cars in the same image? So Correct, yeah, the same. Uh, the images, but uh, the images that Jack has it has no bias and cars according to these Correct, yeah, exactly. That's not the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're randomly uh, sending those images, then you should get similar type of class correlation across all different animals. So, other than this class correlation bias, uh, as I was mentioning, it can be different types of bias, right? Uh, annotators can annotate things very differently. One annotator cannot mention at all some classes. There can be QA bias, where the quality assurance person uh, will tend to approve a lot of images just to perform the task faster. Or it can be time bias, because this annotation job is a very manual and uh, time-consuming job. So as they start working more and more, initially they might be unbiased, and then as time goes on, they will just get used to it annotating certain things, and then you want to catch that uh, bias across the time. And uh, there can be a lot of different types of bias, right? So when you're trying to find those biases, during the annotation process, you need to have tools that will record everything that they're doing. More or less, it will be a timestamp. There will be uh, uh, when they created who created, under which role they created, who approved. So all this information, if you save it in a JSON file, then you will be able to create tool sets that will automate this process of finding uh, those different uh, biases. So what we're building on our end is we give a rich uh, annotation tool set, and then we build on top of that some tutorials that we can take our JSON data and then find those biases very quickly. Uh, as uh, it's, it's already pre-made Jupyter notebooks that you can just use to find those processes, right? And then the way you would find the imperfect data in these cases, well, first you need to visualize uh, your JSON file in a uh, in a very nice plot, and then you need to query and filter the subset of your data set similar to uh, the thing that I showed earlier. So. Once you subset, then you can really see whether there is a bias or not bias. And then once you find that subset, then you can find the mistake in your subset very quickly. Let's say out of 10,000 images, you're only interested in this 100 image. Uh, you will find them, you will check them, and then you can perform some type of actions. So either send these images back to the annotation or uh, delete those images or uh, approve those images, uh, things like that. So those type of query system and uh, making actions on your subsets will really help you to find uh, the bias to between the data sets. 
So here's an example of uh, such a use case. Again, we have a lot of football players, and then when you're uh, searching for whatever you need, in this case, I have a polygon wrongly annotated in my bounding box data set. So what I can do is I can say, give me all the images that have polygon in it, and then out of these uh, tens of thousands of images, it will just, in a matter of seconds, it will find the one that uh, can potentially con contain uh, an error. Uh, often you need to decrease your data set from a really large one to a really small one and then kind of dig down there a bit more to uh, get more time. And then, as I was mentioning, versioning itself is becoming a really big challenge and uh, what we are building in our platform is a really easy tools that will operate like GitHub and at any point in time when you feel that you have a really good uh, data set, you can timestamp that, version that, and then go and do the modification there. And then you can come back to any version that you created in the past and uh, recover that and continue from that uh, place. As uh, uh, it might happen that the model will decrease the accuracy and you didn't do really intend to do so. And then the last uh, thing that uh, what we're doing is uh, dealing with how to find the corner cases very easily and how to deal with this uh, class imbalance. So what our machine learning research team did is uh, they create this metric uh, which we call an entropy but it's not really related to entropy uh, which is more or less some type of importance score for each image. So not every image is affecting your uh, model the same way. So if you want to really increase and boost your model accuracy, then you need to find more diverse images all the time. So what we're doing is giving higher score to uh, more diverse images and the lower score to the images that we have already seen to not really do the same job twice as uh, we need to do this tens of thousands of times. And as a result, our initial experiments are showing that even with three times less data that you can achieve the same level of accuracy as you will do randomly picking a data set from uh, a pile of uh, images, right? Uh, great, so, and then the way we're approaching this is like a very simple uh, tool set that we built. So one click model training will allow you to build a new model in the platform and then you can use that model to get those entropy scores uh, in the platform automatically and once you get the entropy scores then you can sort the entropy scores from the highest to lowest and send only the highest uh, entropy score or, or the most uncertain images to the annotation while skipping uh, all the non-relevant uh, ones uh, to be not annotated. All right, so as, uh, as it comes to the conclusion, very often the model that you're building and you're trying to increase the accuracy, it is not really the model that you need to improve, it is the data set that you need to improve. And this is becoming a lot more important problem than uh, the AI world that we're living in with the models. And uh, what we're building in our company is like an easier tool set for uh, CD enthusiasts, or even people that have very little knowledge about computer vision, to build those no, uh, to build those models, to improve those data sets, and then make sure that uh, everything uh, is working properly in the production, rather than uh, struggling with day-to-day uh, -day CD operations. Well, this would be it. Thanks a lot uh, for listening. <laughs> I will ask the first question. So, uh, you said that you have this metric, which is which you call uh, no. the column is entropy. It's our yeah. proprietary sure. algorithm that we don't share with the community. Okay, so it's uh, it's about finding images. That I don't really understand what it does. So it's filtering uh, out similar images so that you don't have similar ones uh, multiple times. It's something like copy learning. 
Okay. Exactly. So it is exactly active learning. So it finds the images uh, that can potentially have rare classes and uh, it has never seen before. So because we want to make our data set balanced and if you have generic world data set or uh, some certain objects uh, appear so often that you initially build a very accurate prediction for that class. So now you're struggling to find uh, the ones that are not happening. Mm. So and, and you do that before any annotations? Uh, or you tune it? Because in that yeah, we really tune it. Yeah. So when you, uh, when you do this one-click model training, then you can use that model to get the score. And then you can uh, do a little bit more annotation, send it back, and so then this will Uh, any more questions? Uh, so this dataset sharing is it public? Is it? Uh, yes, it's in our website. We just released a month ago. So you can go there. You can submit the dataset, and uh, we will publish the dataset on your account. And uh, what about uh, submitting the uh, that one we're working with the APIs. Uh, we can do it. It's a little bit harder because it's more like in an upcoming month at least. So you you envision that it will be a topic uh, that you will use? Correct. Because on our end, we don't really save those huge data sets. You can connect. You can keep your data set in Azure, for example, and then still visualize it in our cloud. So active learning, I would say, is generically there is a uh, wide, wide term to use to select uh, more certain data. Within active learning, there is many different algorithms. It can be like a clustering-based algorithm. It can be diversity-based algorithm, it can be consistency-based algorithms to uh, do those things. So on our end, we're using something else that we developed in-house, but then it's a very active area of research. Uh, yeah, so was this answering your question? Yeah. You said there is a one-click model training for the So the question is, uh, there is a one-click model training, uh, and then which algorithm uh, we're using. So at the moment, we're using five different tasks, which is classification, object detection, semantic segmentation, instance segmentation, and pose estimation. And we are using uh, the Tectron 2-based algorithms so from Facebook AI research. For classification, uh, we're using uh, daily, or uh, it's, it's again, we're we're in love with Facebook data research. So this is a transformer? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think we, we have heard about it a couple of hours ago. Uh, can you explain the project in military RDM and uh, what is the price? Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the price is not for public in general, but uh, our prices are starting uh, from twenty thousand dollars, but it can be used anyway. Right? So uh, we are not a big fan of military research. But, uh, uh, you know, there is no way to plan. We provide a platform to people uh, to recognize their agricultural crops, or they can use the same way the tanks. Uh, Any more questions? Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.